Vincent. So just to get everybody consent, this uh, webinar will be recorded and it will be published, uh, will be uploaded in the YouTube later on. So just type in the chat box to welcome everyone and please introduce yourself when uh, if you're joining us. And later on in the webinar, feel free to uh, post your questions or comments in the chat box. And during the Q&A session, we will have an in-depth discussion with Zoom. So, shall we start now, Axel? Yes, please. Jim, can we? Yeah, ready when you I'm are. ready. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, evening, afternoon. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alice. I'm currently working in uh, Hong Kong Sanatorium Hospital, and I'm a Taiwanese. Axel, introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Axel Ng from Malaysia. Welcome to our webinar tonight. We, we will be your co-host of tonight. And thank you for being with us in the next wonderful hour. So before I start to introduce our speaker, please allow me to give a very brief introduction to our group, to who we are. We are the Global Leadership. Let me switch another slide. We are the Global Leadership and Mentoring in Medical Physics. And our... Uh, uh, our objectives of the, this mentoring program are to develop leadership role among young medical physicists 
and to provide guidance and support for young medical physicists by creating an atmosphere of open to uh, of, of um, meaningful communication and trust can be exist. Right, thank you, Alice. And this program was founded and organized by Professor Kwan Hong Eng since 2016. The mentor consists of world's medical physics leaders, for example, Professor Eva Beza from uh, South Australia, Professor Thomas Crom from uh, Mid, uh, Peter McKellen uh, Medical Center, and Professor Robert Jarrett from the States. Currently, we have about 22 mentees who join on board. To know more about our, uh, to, to know more about us, you can easily find our website, Facebook, or Instagram link in the chat box. Tonight, the webinar will also be uploaded to YouTube after it ends. Welcome to follow our social media to track all the upcoming webinars and events. You can see the link in the chat room just to load the chat room. You can see our link, and maybe we will post it later because some the some of the participants will turn join us later so you may not able to see the link so we will post the link in the chat room later so today we are very glad to invite dr jim of faculty to uh, to be our speaker to share his valuable experience working in the industry and he is the R uh, the ct rng collaborations manager with uh, siemens health healthy Mears company so um Without further ado, let's welcome our speaker to today, Dr. Jim. Yeah, James, will be kind enough to share your screen now. And yeah, for your information, absolutely. this talk will take about 40 minutes, followed by a 15 minutes uh, Q&A session. Please leave your comments or questions in the chat box so that we could address it later. So James, uh, today you would like to share with us about working industry or medical physicist journey. James, the yeah. platform is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. I'm very I'm very honoured to be uh, invited to a mentoring program, which uh, I'm very glad to have done before uh, in a different scenario and a different mentoring program. So yeah, without further ado, let me kind of give you a little bit of a, a taste on what it's like to work in industry. Um, a bit about my own background. I am a trained medical physicist, and I moved into industry um, about two years ago. So I'm not actually in industry all that long, um, but it's um, it's been an interesting journey and I can share with you some tips and, and tricks on, on how to get into industry or the type of things that we do in industry. Now, I'm also going to switch off my video just to preserve my bandwidth, if that's all right. Um, good. So everyone should be uh, aware and can see my screen. So <clears throat> pretty much as medical physicists, everyone who works in a hospital has some awareness of industry, right? Whether it's things like working with Siemens on installations of new equipment, or radiotherapy Linux with Electa or Varian, most people are aware that industry exists and it's kind of inextricably linked to medical physics in one way or another. So what am I going to discuss in the next 40 minutes? It'll be things like a little bit on clinical medical physics, which people would probably already know, um, a little on the industry of medical imaging. Now I've focused on imaging because that's my background. Um, I have a little bit of radiation therapy in there as well, but that is not really my expertise. So hopefully, um, some of this is transferable. It's about working in industry in general, so it shouldn't be too different, whether it's imaging or therapy. Um, why medical physics are desirable for industry? So things that I used in my kind of application on how to get this job in industry um, and what it's like to work in industry and what is the kind of work that might be available. I'll try finish up with discussing some cutting edge industry research topics. We have 40 minutes. I think that might take a bit longer, so I'll, I might cut that short a little bit, depending on the time. Now, if you do a word cloud on medical physics, you get four top frequency words, which are clinical, research, imaging, and radiation therapy. Now, I wrote this as hardly a surprise because they are the main kind of core parts of medical physics that we think of when we do our day-to-day -day work. Um, I'll try to discuss over the next 40 minutes a few of these types of topics, especially the clinical and research ones, because these are the ones that we're interested in from an industry perspective. In particular to medical imaging, if you look at imaging rates in, in adults and children, and I, I focus more on US data because I'm based in the United States, um, is this an area that's under growth? Yes. And the whole point of this is that if there's growth in imaging in terms of how many exams are done per patient, there's growth in the amount of equipment that's available. And then this, of course, has a knock-on effect on the number of physics physicists that would work in certain institutions. Now you can see these, um, these graphs. Uh, let me change my laser pointer to uh, something a bit more useful. 
um, screen, pointer options, laser. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. So this graph on the right shows that CT imaging is increasing, whereas things like X-ray um, and ultrasound are staying fairly static over the last few years. Now, we've only gone up to 2020 because of the pandemic in 2021 and 2022 have kind of been a bit weird in terms of, of numbers of exams and, and, and kind of requirements for being sent for exams have changed quite a lot as well. But overall, the imaging services market, as you can see on this bottom right-hand graphic here, is kind of predicted to grow by, by quite a substantial amount um, in terms of its, its revenue of billions of, of, of US dollars, with a, a figure of about 7.3% for a CAGR, which is the compound annual growth rate. So predictions that it's going to get much bigger. So that shouldn't be too surprising, I would imagine. Now, does this translate into jobs in hospitals for people like us who are doing uh, radiation therapy or, or imaging or anything like that? Um, what do we need versus what do we want? What do imaging services require? What does a radiation therapy service require? And unfortunately, there really isn't any clear answer on that. Uh, it's dependent on a lot of factors, such as the type of equipment available, patient accessibility to services, education of staff, roles and responsibilities of staff, the country you live in, and you can find all these sorts of publications out there trying to estimate how many medical physics people you need per institute. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this is because you might think that, well, actually, that might be the only route you can take. But my, my talk today is aimed at showing you that actually there's, there's routes within industry that you might not have thought of. If you look at the hardware numbers for, for different countries, you can see that CT, MR and PET scanners it varies quite widely from country to country, right? So a lot of, you know, let's say Japan and the US here on the on the left hand side have quite a lot of, of uh, scanners per million population, whereas at the other end, Mexico, Colombia, Costa Rica may not have quite such a high accessibility. So the routes for doing medical physics might be a little bit more limited. Um, Again, there's a little graphic down here showing you the Asia Pacific MRI equipment market size. Again, this is another massive increase up to, up to about 2029. Now that translates into the number of exams the patients get, because obviously the less amount of scanners there are, the less amount of scans there are. Um, so again, US and Austria leading the pack uh, per thousand population for the amount of exams, whether it's CT, MR or PET. Um, all the way up to you know other countries that don't really utilize their equipment as much. So the point is that there's that there might be different routes available depending on what type of physics you do. In particular to clinical trials, we had a recent publication showing that uh, we queried uh, all the medical physics centers across Europe to ask what, what their medical physicists do in trials. Now this was radiotherapy and imaging, so it was a combined effort. And what you can see on the, the graphic here on the right is that the, the, the vast amount of stuff that people would do with clinical trials would be radiation protection in this blue column or radiotherapy QA. So that tends to be the biggest kind of marker of what people do on their day-to-day -day jobs. Now, people can do a lot of other things such as trial design, not many people doing that. Uh, complex data analysis, maybe a little bit on that. So we should really be pushing ourselves as medical physicists to not just do the routine things. And that's something that's very important in industry because a lot of the routine jobs like radiation protection and radiotherapy QA is not necessarily what we're, we're trying to do. So it's, we, we get rid of a lot of the routine work, but we replace all that by research and design. Now, this might be of interest to some people. This is a, a job ad that a friend of mine sent me for an accountant. He's an accountant. Um, and what I wanted to draw your attention to is the amount of typical duties. So, you know, for this particular, I'm not going to read them out, but for, for this particular one, there's about 11 jobs, 11 duties, 11 or 12 tasks that you would have to know about. And this is for this particular post. So kind of an average salary of what you get as a medical physicist in the United States, at least starting off. Um, and what you find from that is this kind of number of tasks and duties, if you look at it from a medical physics perspective. So this is a recent job ad as well for a job in Ireland where I'm from. So we have 10 principal duties. Actually, it went to 20 principal duties. It actually went to 27 principal duties, right? So now this isn't to say that obviously as medical physicists, we do more work than an accountant. It just goes to show that the variety of what we do um, can be quite broad, at least from an imaging perspective. Now, I won't read through all of these, but essentially a lot of them are what we call soft skills. So if you look at number three, it's to provide leadership, to be an active member. 
um, advise on the acquisition of new technology. So these are soft skill things, right? They, they might not necessarily need highly technical skill um, or really, really in-depth knowledge of physics, but essentially it's supposed to be at the level where you have lots of soft skills as well. Okay, so 27 duties against 10 duties. Now it's a poor study of N equals one, but essentially it demonstrates the broad scope required of a medical physicist. And, and this is an imaging physicist job. So for radiotherapy, obviously this could be quite different, but a lot of the soft skill duties would be very similar. So provide leadership, actively drive and participate in academic research, this kind of stuff. Now I kind of summarize all of these as, as the reminder of the skills of what we have as medical physicists. And I think people probably don't appreciate them too much and they undersell themselves in a way. So instead of me reading this off, so essentially the skills that we have, whether, whether you know it or not, if you're doing this job, you have an interest in physical sciences. You can't really do this job if you don't. Uh, you probably have an interest in patient care and medicine because obviously that's why we do this, this work. Other things like attention, Attention to detail, concentration skills, motivation. Again, these are soft skill things. Good problem solving skills, very important. Observational skills and obviously hard, hard tasks that we would have to do are things like mathematical and technical skills. Now, the reason I'm telling you about that is because who, who technically hires medical physicists? So if you look at a list, and I've come up with this list, so this is by no means complete. Um, this is kind of divided in the traditional imaging and therapy equipment manufacturers separated from medical device companies, which is number eight. And the reason I did that is because medical device companies make things like uh, surgical equipment, ventilators, catheters, stents, these kind of things that aren't typically medical physics, at least not in the imaging or radiotherapy domain. And so we have eight kind of levels of places that would hire people with a medical physics background. And just to show you, I mean, this is my own background. Um, and rather than going through every single piece of it, everything I've done in the past as well fits into one of these categories, right? So I've done nothing that's very unusual. It's a pretty traditional background in terms of formal medical physics program I did in the UK. Uh, I worked as a medical physicist in the UK for a long time. I moved to the Middle East to work uh, at a hospital. I, I moved to Singapore to work at a, the university hospital, National University Hospital in Singapore. Um, then I moved to Siemens to work for a, a medical instrumentation manufacturer. Okay, so basically I've worked in the top four of these. I've never worked in the bottom four. So pretty traditional background. So I think many of you out there who are working as medical physicists probably fit some of these bills as well in terms of where you've worked. Now there's other ones in where you might like to work and it's probably one of these eight things. I put in pharmaceutical companies there as well, and that's probably more geared towards our nuclear medicine colleagues who have more of a background in terms of um, radio pharmaceutical design and, and you know, designing new therapies and new imaging agents and things like that. Um, they'd be reasonably rare in terms of what they do. Now, a quick example of what's available. If you go on to, I did this this morning on indeed.com and you type in medical physicist, I'm currently in London. Uh, even though I work in the US, and you get one of 57 jobs. So there's lots and lots of stuff out there. Um, depends on where you are, obviously, within what part of the world you live in or where you're willing to relocate to. to. But uh, I think at the moment, it's definitely uh, a market for somebody looking for a job. There's quite a lot of stuff available out there, um, depending on where you want to go and what you want to do. Uh, one important point as well was that I noticed that remote work was a thing in 32 of 57 of these jobs, which meant there was no requirement to be at a particular location at any time. Now, these are the kind of things we need to know about in imaging. So this, it's a pretty big table. I'm not going to read through it, but essentially, if you work in imaging like I do, you need to know a lot of this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So you need to know if you want to pick an imaging modality to, for a particular trial, you need to know the temporal resolution. Is it really expensive? Is it portable? Um, what's the type of radiation involved? So there's, there's a lot of stuff you need to know at very short notice. And I imagine this is probably even more complicated than things like radio, radiation therapy. So it just shows the breadth of what we need to know in imaging really. Now, this is another um, job ad I found this morning. Um, I had a hard time trying to figure out what this job actually was. So let me read out a few key parts for it. And I want you out there to at least think in your mind or maybe type in the chat box, what kind of job you think this actually is. So experience in 
modeling development, strong programming skills. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but various understanding of statistical modeling techniques, research publications and conferences, uh, experience with data architecture, experience with LaTeX, if you know what that is, it's a writing tool, uh, experience with statistical data analysis, uh, documentation reviews, experience with machine learning, such as TensorFlow, Keras or PyTorch or anything like that. Now, to me, this sounds like an academic kind of job. Um, it sounds like it's a very, I don't know, senior professor or something very difficult like that. Um, does anyone have any idea what it might be? Research assistant, somebody said, image processing engineer. I think you might be surprised. I was, uh, I was quite surprised when I saw it. The answer is actually a finance analyst. So this is an ad for the Bank of America in the UK. So, you know, this is a very non-traditional route for somebody with a medical physics background. But to me, a lot of this stuff is very similar, right? So experience with machine learning platform, programming skills, communication skills, uh, team player. So some soft skills thrown in there as well. But essentially somebody who is quite computational with machine learning, um, a lot of statistical data analysis and things like that. So it just goes to show there's stuff out there that you may not have thought of in terms of where you might want to work. And uh, obviously there's lots of banks in, in most parts of the world that are, that are looking for people like this, not just here in the UK or in America for that matter. Now, this would be more like a typical uh, employers that you would find in industry for medical physics. This is by no means complete. This is just a list of companies I, I could come up with from the top of my head last week. Um, these would be the typical players that people would move from the standard medical physics environment and then go to work for, essentially. So you'll probably recognize a lot of these names based on, on where you are and what you do. These would be big international employers. Now, there's obviously local uh, employers that don't feature on this list. And one thing I've done on purpose was I've left out a lot of AI software because we're going to discuss that in a little bit because it's actually quite important. Um, but just so you're aware, I mean, if you, if you did want to have a look at any of these websites, all of them are, are hiring people at various points in their career, including Siemens. I'll just put that out there too. Um, if you look at the top 10 medical device companies in the world for last year, and this is in terms of revenue in US dollars, you can see the usual players like Medtronic, Philips, Siemens, Cardinal Health, Stryker, all these kind of big multinational companies. And uh, if you're as interested as I am, I went on their websites a while ago just to see what was available. And if you just put in research development uh, jobs for most of these, you get quite a lot of returns. So 61 available at Fresenius, uh, 173 available at Johnson & Johnson, 28 at BD. Um, and all of these all of these companies have jobs currently open for various levels of scientists. Now, they don't always call you a medical physicist because they always want you to do something slightly different. Um, so it depends on the company, but they'll hire you as a scientist. Um, and at the moment, there's currently lots and lots of availability. So just keep that in mind. Now, one thing I wanted to kind of discuss separately was things like software and AI. Um, there's lots of employment in software, which to me these days usually means things like machine learning or you know, essentially anything artificial intelligence related. And Siemens is no different. We do a lot of these kind of, of um, software developments as well. And we'll have more slides on that later on as well when I discuss the cutting edge research part. Essentially for this graph that I have in the middle, this is called the Gartner hype cycle. So essentially you have a graph of expectations against time. And normally there'd be some part of some kind of trigger at the start that everybody wants to get on board and do some of this research. It goes all the way up until people realize, well, actually it's not very good. Uh, and then it goes down and people stop using it. So if you notice here, things like chatbots, if you've ever tried to talk to your local bank, uh, you have to talk to a machine by text. It doesn't work very well. It just doesn't replace a human. Um, autonomous vehicles is down here as well. So they're so far not very good. They were very good. People really wanted to do all the basic research. Uh, and then it takes some time for this slope of enlightenment period where people actually see the value in it and the hype is over, but it starts to turn into a proper product. Um, most medical AI is still back along here. So people are still very interested in, in a lot of this medical AI. Um, it has yet to kind of fully be, fully really take off in terms of its clinical usability. And to that end, if you look on the FDA website, who are the Federal Food and Drug Administration in the United States, who basically give a license to some companies to use these things in a clinical scenario, 
there's about 50 programs out there that people can buy um, to use in their clinic. I've given you a few examples here. There's no way I could read out all of these because there's so many, but essentially there's a few very big players here, like ones that detect stroke on CT scans, uh, coronary artery algorithm scans, cancerous lesions in liver and lungs, uh, diabetic retinopathy using retinal images. So again, anything you can think of that's got an image in medical imaging, there's probably an AI algorithm to be able to do it. Whether it's FDA approved or not is a different story. So just keep that in mind. There's a, there's a lot of stuff out there on, on AI algorithms and how they can be used within a clinic. And to that end, there's lots of academic employment in this because it's, it's expanding at such a rapid rate. Um, and industry is hiring for many AI related jobs too. And these are just some articles I could find online to, to show you how important this stuff is because there's now new centers for artificial intelligence and medical imaging. Um, I had a quick look and I found four of them. Um, some of them a little bit older, right? So this one is from 2018, but it's actually only opened not that long ago because it was a new building. Um, so there's different ways to, to, you know, there's different routes to be able to do all this AI and a lot of it is, is academic. Having a quick look on the Siemens website this morning. So I, I put in a search term for R&D and artificial intelligence and I found 263 open jobs at Siemens. Um, you can see some of them. So senior deep learning scientist, senior data scientist, senior deep learning scientist for whole body imaging. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff out there, whether it's an interest of yours or you know if you want to go into industry or, or in academics there's lots and lots and lots of these new things coming out now there's other kind of routes to to be able to if you're not too interested in moving directly into industry there's other routes of collaborative research which is what i do for a living so sometimes companies work with institutes to develop particular research projects that benefit both parties it's it's technically a win-win because Academics publish on, on a lot of academic things and the companies get this academic experience. Funding might be from companies. So let's say Philips or Siemens, for example, might give you as a medical physicist money if you're doing something that Siemens are very interested in. Um, or we may apply, apply for a joint application to some sort of national or government body that funds big research projects. And the good thing about that is that medical physicists are they're usually pretty good at finding difficult problems and, and especially having the freedom to pursue the solutions. It's something we don't always have in industry. Whereas the companies are very good at taking discoveries and, and developing them further into a product. Now, this quote that I have here is actually from quite a, a large US university. This is their kind of um, aim. It's on their website, on their front page. And it says, our university is committed to excellent teaching innovative research. So this is the part where they're really keen to have company involvement, industry involvement, because that's the kind of leading edge of stuff. Um, and you can see in the year in this number of, of co-authored papers between people who work at companies and academics, um, that's increasing by quite a long way year on year. So it started off 76,000, now 84,000 in 2019. I don't have updated numbers since the pandemic, but um, I would imagine it would be larger. So it just goes to show that industry involvement in academic research is quite a is quite a big thing some examples that you probably have heard of so astrazeneca for example they worked with oxford university for the covid vaccine um, the dyson center for engineering design so that's by dyson who make traditionally made vacuum cleaners they now have a, a center of engineering at the university of cambridge uh, siemens our own company have a new center well they had a new center in 2006 but it was now recently extended on a research facility with the University of Tennessee. And that's kind of been expanded uh, many times over the last few years. That was to develop new detectors for PET imaging. So it just goes to show that this partnership really, really takes off in quite a big way. And it's, uh, it's certainly something that's gonna keep growing. Essentially what you would want to do is to move from a silo situation where industry, university and government exists completely independently to this situation over here on the right where they're all very closely connected through various initiatives, such as uh, joint grant funding, um, staff sharing. So sometimes you have people based at institutes who work for a company and they do academic research sponsored by the company. So there's various approaches to doing that as well. Now, a very brief word on salary. Um, this is <laughs> usually what people are, are quite interested in and um, someone might ask about it, but I thought I'd get ahead of it. Um, the US is a little bit more difficult to, to predict salaries because all the hospitals are private salaries. In the UK, 
um, the NHS, which is the health service in the UK, this is essentially what you would get paid as a, a physicist, depending on your starting level. So if you were fresh out of university, you'd probably start here, uh, less than two years experience, and you can go all the way up to the end. So you can go all the way up to Ben D, which is a, a, head, of a head of a department, for example. One other point is that industry tends to pay quite a bit more depending on the country you're from or the area you're from. So for example, in the US, there's quite a big difference between an academic salary and an industry salary. Um, not quite the same in the UK, but you, you, get the, you get the gist that industry pays a little bit more, uh, possibly a lot more depending on what you do. Now, this is a very broad term as well. It's, this isn't just for physics. This would be for pretty much everybody. So it's, it's hard to pin down exactly what that change would be for medical physics. Now, some general tips if you did want to work with your background of medical physics and industry um, would be to join things like mail bases, basically get yourself informed, get some more information. So I've put in two examples here. One is the UK medical physics mail base. So that's the web address you can use to register. The other one is the AAPM in the US. So they have a lot of national, you know, as in inside the US and international mailing lists at that web address. And it's free to register. You just get yourself uh, signed up and then you get various emails about um, job postings or things that people are interested in or various problems that people might need solved that you think, well, actually I've done this before, I can give my input. So it's just like a forum for, for collaborating. Um, join LinkedIn and ResearchGate, follow companies you're interested in working for. You know, you don't have to follow one company, you could follow 20 that, that do things like, oh, I'm really interested in artificial intelligence for image processing. You could find some companies and you know get in touch with them on LinkedIn or, or just follow what they do and see if they're developing things that you might be interested in doing. Um, other things like attending conferences, it's, it's a little bit more difficult these days, but essentially networking is, is, is kind of important because you get to meet the right people at the right time. I put in a few options of keeping an open mind. Uh, one would be to consider moving or relocating if possible. Um, when I was younger, I did that quite a lot. Um, it was really good because it gives you a broader scope on your resume. It, it also gives you some kind of very broad cultural experiences and to see how medical physics is done in different places. Um, next one would be to see that many opportunities might be flexible. So like I said, the ones that I, the job ads that I found on Indeed this morning, 32 of those 57 said they were remote work. So essentially, it doesn't matter where you live. You could live in a certain country, but in a completely different part of the country. Um, so that's becoming more of a thing now since the pandemic that, you know, they may give you a little less money, but then give you complete freedom to work whatever hours you like um, or work a four day week or work weekends or, you know, all these different things that might be more, more negotiable now than they were before. Now, the, the second one, keeping open mind number two, um, is something I showed you from earlier on, which was the finance analyst job. You're probably likely to be employable in other areas. So things that you wouldn't really have suspected before because of the strong analytical nature of your education. Basically, you would be called a numbers guy. So if you're anyway good at maths, um, mathematics, then, then you're probably hireable in a lot of different industries, probably more than you think you are. Now, the last one is kind of important as well. If you, if you want to work in industry, your formal education, like having a, a, you know, a, a really certified medical physics training program is probably not required. Um, it's not really a requirement within industry to have that. So your background can be a lot more flexible in terms of what you've done in the past. And it's definitely more based on what you're doing now and the skills that you use at the current moment. Now, I'll finish up for the last maybe 15 minutes or so, um, showing you some things you could work on in industry. Now, what I'm going to try to do is show you things like some cutting edge research, not just from Siemens where I work, but from lots of other companies too. And hopefully these will kind of give you an idea as to some of the technical things you can work on with your medical physics background within industry. The first one is uh, something I find really cool. So this, this is a brand new concept. It's not even a product yet. So the graphic on the right is a, an MR LINAC, which does exist. So this is a combination of a, a radiotherapy treatment LINAC coupled with a 1.5 T MR unit. Now, a company in California called Reflection are very interested in doing this with a PET unit. So essentially, they would do real-time PET imaging, and the lines of response, like the photons that come out of patients, they would shoot an X-ray along that line. So you're doing real-time treatment, and they're calling this um, biology-guided radiotherapy. Um, and they have some papers, you can, you can look up their website, it's very interesting uh, thing. So 
uh, this little graphic kind of shows you one of the issues with, with a moving lung tumor um, and a, a treatment field. And the, the graphic at the bottom is taken directly from the Reflection website. So essentially what they're trying to do, they have a product at the moment called the Reflection X1, which at the moment only does IMRT. Um, they want to expand this to do PET imaging on it. So they would take these PET signals that you can see on the graphic and essentially just shoot an X-ray along that particular line uh, directly into that tumor. Now it's not a product at the moment. Um, it's limited by US law to investigational use. So it's something that I think is gonna, is gonna take off in not too distant future. It's, it's quite an interesting tool. Next one is something I'm, I'm, I'm quite passionate about myself. Quite a lot of radionuclide therapy, uh, design of therapy agents, trials, uh, things like that, picking new radiopharmaceutical isotopes. And there's lots of companies out there that do this kind of stuff. One that I've worked with personally is a company called Nanomab. So they make a lot of uh, diagnostic and therapeutic drugs and they basically need people to essentially help them with their research. So whether it's things like dosimetry or designing a trial or image analysis, and there's, there's many, many companies that do this kind of stuff. So I've given you a few examples here. So some of these bigger companies like Lantheus, they might have 10 or 11 investigational agents that may or may not come to any sort of final product. So you can see their phases here. So they've done a preclinical phase, phase one, phase two, phase three. This is a registered filing, which essentially means they've had regulatory um, contact and market means that it's finally gotten to, to the market as a sellable product. So you can see so far they have none of these, but all their products are at various stages of, of been able to do that. Now, another one would be things like dosimetry. And if you look through any of the publications or any, if you're any way interested in it, you can see that there's more and more and more of this stuff going on uh, in, in various countries. So I found a few papers that show 80% uh, more patients uh, having radionuclide therapy from 2007, 2017 in the UK. Um, various groups come up with position statements. If you look through the literature to see um, how much there is out there in terms of publications, you can find these kind of graphs. So we have by the type of cancer on this graphic, um, by, the, by beta emitting isotopes here, by alpha emitting isotopes here. So you can see it's kind of taken off here with the blue. So this was with the approval of radium-223, uh, also called Zolfigo. Um, so again, that's an industry-led action that has led to a massive up uprising in the, in the amount of publications, but also in the amount of use in terms of its, its clinical usability. Um, if you don't know a whole lot about it, it, it you know, this targeted radionuclide stuff needs a knowledge of tumor biology. So you need a, a good scientific background for this. Obviously there's lots of issues with radiation exposure and non-homogeneous dose distributions. Um, and it can be a lot more targeted than external beam radiotherapy. From our physics backgrounds, a lot of these companies are interested in people who can understand a lot of this stuff. Um, so how would you, what type of particle would you want to use? Small tumors, large tubers, what type of energy emissions would you want? What's the target to non-target ratio? What's the excretion rate? Is the half-life good enough, long enough or short enough that it's uh, useful? Um, and obviously things like radiation exposure become quite a, an important feature as well. And obviously things like the cost and preparation and quality control. This would be a brief list. Now this is no means complete list either. These are certain things that are available and the types of energies um, that show you whether you can use beta emitting or, or alpha emitting agents. And this is just for information to, to show you that there's still a lot of active research on these particular isotopes. Now, like I said, other companies are interested in, in looking at things like the chemistry of these things as well. So things like chelators that, that stick the kind of, uh, that stick the isotope uh, into something for biological transport uh, to make sure that it targets the correct cells, vectors, linkers, all this sort of chemistry jargon, which might be more applicable to our, our nuclear medicine colleagues in the audience that, that might be interested in this. Um, next one would be something that's been relatively new, uh, photon counting CT. So this is something that we're actively working on at Siemens, and we've just released the first clinical system in the world to have this particular technology. Um, if you know anything about a CT scanner, um, currently they have these energy integrating systems. So there's a scintillator in there. And what that does is it converts the x-rays to light, and then that is picked up um, by an by a photodiode and convert it into an electrical current. 
Well, essentially, you have a scintillating light, the same way as you do in, in nuclear medicine. Um, you get this energy weighted accumulated signal. So that's the, the current standard of, of CT uh, detectors. It looks like this if you take a slice out of it. You might have seen this already. Uh, Siemens have come up with this new technology, photon counting CT, um, and essentially it does away with the scintillating part. So it's a semiconductor detector. And what happens is an X-ray would produce a charge proportional to the X-ray energy. So each individual impact uh, is measured, allowing a measurement of the energy information. So now we have a detector that's energy selective and it does threshold based counting of individual pulses, the same as you would do in the spec system. So you have a pulse like this with a threshold and above that it's, uh, it's counted and below that it's not counted. Um, why is this of any way use? So it gives us these kind of benefits like better contrast because we have no noise in the images. We can kind of remove the noise by electronic thresholding. It allows you to make smaller detector pixels. So it gives you much higher spatial resolution. Currently CT is about 0.6 millimeters uh, resolution slice thickness. And now we can get down to 0.2 millimeter slice thickness. You've got spectral sensitivity because now there's spectral information in, in every single scan, uh, which didn't exist before. And of course, like I mentioned, you have things like no electronic noise, so you can obviously use less radiation dose. Uh, this is by T Siemens own terminology, it's called quantum technology. Uh, just to have a quick look at a few images, um, the top image here shows you the malleus, the incus, and the stapy. So these are three tiny, tiny bones that are <clears throat> in your ear. Um, this EID CT is a standard CT scan of these three little bones, and you can't really see a whole lot of detail in there. And with our photon counting detector, you can see the stapes here. So it's, it's this kind of triangular shaped bone. Uh, which can actually be around 0.5 millimeters thick. So you can actually see the length of it at 1.2 and you can see the thickness of it there, which is about half a millimeter thick. So it's, it's quite a tiny bone that you can see with this high resolution imaging. Um, bottom image is a cochlear implant, a uh, cochlea rather. So you can, you can kind of differentiate the shape of this a lot better using photon counting technology. Same with things like stents, you can see uh, cardiac stents a lot better. Uh, top image is from a somatom force, so again, it's a, an older semen scanner. Um, and the bottom one here is a, a prototype system that we had installed uh, earlier this year um, in Germany. So you can see the, the better resolution with this particular image. Now, next would be things like high field MRI. So if you, if you know much about MRI, you've, most systems you find are either 1.5 or 3T. You improve that field strength, so you go much higher up the field strength, you get much better spatial resolution and much shorter acquisition time, but you get a lot of technical issues in terms of field homogeneity. In terms of clinical systems of 70, there's a few available, but about 100 worldwide. Um, there are higher fields like 10 and 11, um, only investigating only investigational systems at the moment. There's also plans for 14T and 20T systems uh, in various parts around the world. And just as a, a kind of a guide, an average cost for these would be about 1 million per Tesla. So again, an increase of 1T would be you know, quite, a, quite a huge investment in terms of how to build this sort of system. There's some links there as well if you want to find some articles on it or, or have a look at any of these other publications. Hey, that will be. Um, another big advancement would be things like helium-free MRI. And if you're anywhere like me, you've seen a lot of these sorts of huge tanks of helium um, being pumped into an MR system. Um, the reasons for all that are here, but I'm, I'm not going to read them out. Essentially, you need a lot of helium to cool an MR scanner. Um, and if you don't, then you have a quench pipe uh, and, and you can lose all your helium very quickly. Siemens have this new system that's an 80 centimeter bore with, with no helium, well, with 0.7 liters of helium inside that's locked for life. So you never need to retop up your helium. It's 0.55T and like most systems now, it's got a lot of deep neural networks and artificial intelligence in there um, to essentially translate conventional imaging into this low field imaging. So it's a scanner that sits on a, on a site without any requirement for a quench pipe or any huge investment of 2000 liters of helium to, to pump in there. Digital PET is, is now quite a, a new thing that's uh, it's, it's a little bit more mature now than it was a few years ago, but there's quite a lot of manufacturers out there that have these digital PET systems. So essentially they replaced all these photomultiplier tubes with, with something digital the same way I just told you about with our photon counting CT. 
and they kind of should, there's publications out there that show you how good these things are in terms of it can see a particular lesion that you couldn't see on an older system and, and things like that. So this is where companies are interested in, in this academic knowledge of people who've been able to do these kinds of studies, showing you that you can get better contrast out of these images uh, and showing you that these new systems are a lot more useful than, than the currently old systems. Um, this is just more of the same. I'll, I'll leave this for you to, to read later on because we're, we're slightly running out of time. So I'll, I'll go through this quite quickly. Um, one last part would be things like large field of view imaging. So Siemens have this large PET scanner that's one and a half meters. There's an Explorer system, which is again, uh, I think it's a two meter system or 1.8 system. And essentially uh, GE have something not quite so similar, but they're, they're seeing that other companies are doing this large field of view system and they want to make a system that works like it, but still doesn't have the, the large lung bore um, that the other manufacturers have. And these systems, there's publications out there on these as well. Um, th these are very new. So this was only released last year, uh, at least by Siemens. The Explorer system was a, a few years previously by United Imaging. Um, and there's information out there. They're, they're still just doing these kind of really early evaluation studies to compare them against other CC, other PET CT scanners, for example. And they show you that you can get a really good signal to noise ratio at two minutes from these long actual field of views, which is the same image quality, uh, same signal to noise as a 16 minute short axis field of view system. So, you know, the benefits are, are essentially less radiation where you can use 14 megabecks or, or a shorter time. So th these are the two things that you trade off against. Um, this is just an image that kind of shows you the same kind of thing that you can do imaging at various time points and they look very, very similar in terms of their diagnostic quality. This is more of the same. Um, and then essentially in terms of how to adapt it to different institutes, there's quite a lot of different problems in terms of this thing is now not the limiting factor anymore. It's, it's other things like how many uptake rooms you have, how many staff do you have, referrals, and all this kind of stuff. So it's not actually the scanner that's the, that's the issue. Uh, last but not least, I want to discuss AI, which is a really important one these days because it's involved at so many points of the imaging chain, such as reconstruction, motion correction, patient setup, post-processing, segmentation. All these sorts of things are, are really taken hold in, in AI. And I've, I have a graph here that I, I got from a guy called Sven Zulsdorf, who works for Siemens. And he separated all these papers into physics and image formation, anatomical intelligence, clinical interpretation, and clinical intelligence. So these four different kind of pillars of how AI can be used. Um, it's particular for molecular imaging, but it's the same for any type of, of AI solution. This would be a reason for why you would need this sort of stuff. So in the UK census workforce census report, they showed that all these CT and MR scans was, you know, they're rapidly increasing in how many there are. Um, but the number of consultants in terms of the people who have to report these images really aren't increasing in the same rate. So basically it's more work for less radiologists. Uh, there's all these new journals out there on artificial intelligence. I found three um, at a very quick look. There's also special AI issues of current journals. So everybody's really getting in on this, this AI stuff. If you do a quick PubMed search in our, looking for the term artificial intelligence in the title or abstract, you get this kind of response. Uh, this was done last year, so we, I don't have full numbers for 2022 or 2021. But essentially, it just shows a kind of a massive explosion of how much stuff is available. And one really important point is that the error rate for this kind of visual recognition challenge in 2015 finally decreased to a level lower than a human error rate. So this is to do with the kind of simultaneous rapid advances in computer hardware. And because of that, all these types of not typical non-healthcare companies are really keen to get in on this, this AI stuff. So these are a few articles I could find um, from the last year or so, where now Facebook is getting in on complex illness. Microsoft is now getting into it. Um, it appointed a chief medical officer just before that announcement of investing $16 billion into healthcare AI. And of course, it doesn't always go right for non-healthcare companies. They, they very uh, rarely know how to handle this kind of data. So they collected information from people across 21 states in the US, including data on lab results, diagnoses, hospital records. Um, and it turns out the patients and doctors hadn't been informed of the Google partnership. Um, so a lot of people were concerned about how this data gets used. Um, 
we kind of demonstrated some work from Siemens that shows in their typical workflow of, of reporting uh, certain scans that you can actually save a lot of time um, from the radiologist perspective. So we showed that if you use AI, you get to save a total of about 100 seconds per, per scan. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but 100 seconds when you have thousands and thousands of scans or hundreds of scans per week to review turns out to be quite a lot of time. Um, so this is quite a, for us, quite a key publication to demonstrate that our AI solutions actually work. Now, my last slide will be on showing you the warning of AI. So a lot of imaging, whether it's nuclear medicine or, or MR or CT, they, they lack this kind of rigorous strategy for evaluating their algorithms. Um, and that was by a group of experts, not necessarily people in industry who were very keen to produce all sorts of programs, but they might not always work. Um, so they came up with a set of best practices that could help transfer research, um, showing you things like potential issues like removing lesions by denoising images. So things that are supposed to be there that you've now removed by doing some some sort of processing. Uh, false positives by segmentation, generalizability of, of training on certain data sets, but then that not working on, on particular data sets. Um, physics items such as harmonization of reconstruction parameters, which is quite difficult in CT and MR, um, and that these should be adapted by the community. They came up with this pyramid of, of how, you should, how you should evaluate your AI algorithm. So there's lots of different routes to be able to, to prove that your data is actually effective and is robust enough to actually be used in a product. And with that, I think I'll finish because I know we're, we're very close to finishing in time. So please do feel free to, to ask me any questions. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jean. Wow, it's a very, you really done a comprehensive research and it inspired me a lot in a great degree, really. You remind me and well saying like, never limit yourself you, with your limited imagination. I never <laughs> thought Indeed. that, I never thought that uh, uh, skills a medical physicist have is actually that similar to another job in the well, in the not, not that relevant field. So, wow. Yeah, indeed. It, it doesn't always have to be in imaging. Like I showed you when you saw that job ad for a finance analyst, I mean, it looks yeah. exactly like something you'd yeah. find for a physicist or an engineer. And I think one of the comments on the chat box thought it was a research engineer. Um, so it, it does go to show that, uh, you know, us physicists, we're employable in, in different roles that we might not traditionally think about. Yes, yes. So uh, it, it's great to know that there are so many new fields, new job opportunities are waiting for us. And I believe our audience are inspired greatly, just like me, because you can see the questions pop up like popcorn in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's begin. Let's begin. Okay. Uh, so the first question from Daniel uh, What role will medical physicists have regarding radiation protection in non ionizing radiation in medicine and in industry? Uh, that depends. I mean, I think, at least in my role, uh, I work in R&D. Um, so I think for a lot of what we do, we, don't, we, we, we give scanners to hospitals. Um, it's then up to them to decide things like their protocols on, you know, shielding calculations, for example, or what type of settings they want to program onto the CT unit to expose their patients. We don't really take any responsibility with that. Um, we would at a factory level. So, for example, where things are made in Germany, at least for Siemens, we would have people in Germany who would have to do those kind of things. So to make sure that... Um, let's say the right filters are used in the right place uh, for CT scanners or x-rays, for example, um, but not on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say that that's a bit more dependent on the institute rather than the company that sells the equipment. Now, to some extent, there's we are responsible for certain exposure parameters, um, but not on a day-to-day -day basis. Um. I'm thinking this question is asking about if the equipment is non-ionizing radiation like laser, MRI, or UV light, or ultrasound, uh, how a medical physician should do to do, I mean, works like radiation protection for this device? Yeah, I think, like I said, it's usually at the factory stage. Um, I think, like on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I wouldn't have anything to do with... Uh, with setting up things like safety aspects of, of the scanners, even if it's an MR scanner. 
Now they'll be programmed in a factory to have a certain SAR, for example, if it's an MR unit. Um, so people on the engineering side who build the system would, would have the responsibility for that, but that's not necessarily something that me as a collaborations manager would actually have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. That doesn't mean to say those jobs aren't available. They certainly are. Um, they just might not be, you know, like I said, it's at a factory stage. So you would be working in a factory um, doing these kind of testing on the on these equipment before they get shipped to a customer, for example. Okay, thank you. So another question is that, is there firewall an automatic requirement for industry to cooperate with the university in research projects? No, um, that depends on the institute. So, for example, most places I would work with, uh, they have agreements in place. So between the institute and Siemens, for example, um, you don't always have to have a firewall, you would have to have disclosure agreements and a master research agreement. So for example, if any of the audience out there are interested in having a collaboration with Siemens, you would contact your local Siemens representative, then they would, if it was something the Siemens wanted to do, they would write a contract. You would sign that contract and say that now you have this agreement to provide research deliverables for money or for, I don't know, exposure at a conference or something like that. So. I'm not sure exactly what firewall are particularly talking about, but it, it's usually done through contract negotiations. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Aman is that is simulation application like MCMC and PHIPS useful in industry <laughs> as medical physicists? Yeah, very much so. Um, MCMP is something we would use a lot. Um, we have certain partners where, you know, let's say for the photon counting CT, for example, that was all done through simulation before it was built. Um, so I don't know if, if people don't know what MCMP is, it's essentially a way of simulating transport of radiation and tissue. And if you're going to build a new scanner, you would you have to model it before you build it. Otherwise, it's a huge waste of money if you've done something wrong. Um, so yes, that's something, at least in the R&D field, that we would use a lot, whether it's a PET scanner or a CT scanner, not so much an MRI, but definitely in CT and PET. Thank you. Um, another question, is that bio, biology guided RT is similar to CRAD technology? I'm not sure what CRAD is. Um, uh, me too. I already <laughs> understand that term, but I, I mean, essentially it's, it's, it's quite basic in its idea. So you would have these photons that come out of the PET radio tracer, and then that's detected by something on the detector. And then an X-ray is shot along the exact same direction. Uh, well, sorry, the opposite direction, but the same line. Um, so it's essentially a, a pretty cool technology that I think doesn't, it's not been fully publicized yet because it doesn't exist, but it's a great concept. And I think that's something with reflection medical, that's really going to t change a lot of things. If you now don't need to do a PET scan, you can just do a PET scan and treatment in the same day. Thank you. Uh, Edgar, would you mind to present the other question? Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa and James. Uh, so the next question will be from Daniel Vicario asking about, can you call, uh, elaborate more on the biology guided radiotherapy? Is this biophysics or medical physics? Uh, well, it's essentially both. Um, right. So the, the bio part is, is just from the PET scan. Um, so, I mean, that to me is medical physics and also the technology to be able to shoot an X-ray beam along the same photon path is medical physics, right? That needs a big understanding of physics on how you can do that, plus engineering, right? So you have to do this at a very fast speed, right? So your, your photons are traveling at the speed of light and they're hitting a detector within a certain number of nanoseconds within those certain number of nanoseconds, you have to shoot an X-ray along the same direction. Um, so it is it is medical physics and it is biophysics because if you have a lot of radio tracer uptake that's not cancer, you don't want to treat it with X-rays. So there's quite a lot of biophysics and quite a lot of technical medical physics in there too. Thank you. Uh, for next question, uh, James, I'm not sure what you want to answer here because it's quite a, a, a particular question. It's about helium free MRI asked by Noro Shakira. So she asked about, can you elaborate more about this topic and what benefit it can introduce to medical application, especially in hospital? And what is the limitation of it? Yeah, I mean, the, the main 
aim for this is because it can be used in hospitals that don't have the infrastructure for traditional MRI. So they might not have routes to quench pipe or they might not have all the shielding requirements available. So essentially what the main aim of this benefit is that it can be stuck anywhere. It can be put into a regular room in a hospital that's got some kind of Faraday cage around it. Um, it's a low field MRI, so it's not a 1.5 or 3T, so it can be used with less shielding requirements. Now that's also a limitation because it's a low field MRI. Like I said earlier, the higher the field strength, the better the signal to noise, the better the spatial resolution. Um, but low field means that it, it's more kind of free to accept some inhomogeneities from the magnetic field. So the big thing is that it's got no helium requirements. It's, it's got helium in it, but it's locked for life and it doesn't need any top ups of helium. So the expenditure is a lot less. But for that less expenditure, you get a lower field uh, MR scanner. Now, the way that's improved in a way is because it's got all this complex neural networks that have trained algorithms to, from 3T images or 1.5T images, to produce images from your 0.55T system that look similar. So again, a lot of it is dependent on AI. But in terms of the hardware, it's a lot cheaper to install. It's got a lot less overheads to fill. So it's a cheaper system to run. Yeah, sound very interesting, isn't it? I think we got yeah. another question about AI as well uh, by Dr. Anek Prata. She asked about, has regulations on AI use in medicine already been issued in developed countries? Yes, that's a very important topic because um, at least in the US, you have to have FDA approval before you can market it as a medical device. Um, it's the same in Europe, so it needs a CE mark. It's not quite as strict in Europe. But in the US, unless it has an FDA approval, then you cannot sell it as a, as a medical device. And the regulations to go through that steps, they were only announced uh, earlier this year or possibly late last year. So the FDA on their website for AI, they gave a list of things that they were going to look for um, in terms of does this AI algorithm do what it says it's going to do and how they were going to actually investigate whether they were going to approve these AI solutions or not. So yeah, that's that's very important, um, a very good point. And I think it's something that will change very often as all these AI algorithms become more complex. Some of them are built as black boxes. So you, you put an image in, you don't know what it's doing and you get an image out. Um, and I think regulation on that is very important. Yeah, I think we have to keep an eye on this development, especially when we are working in clinical or industrial academia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's something, like I said, we do a lot of in collaboration. So we we would work with certain research partners to investigate certain AI algorithms, but then try put those to market at some point. Yeah, great. I think the next question by Hero, he asked about in order to, to do high-end research, how Siemens build their research infrastructure? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, <laughs> one, 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 way, one way we do it is by having people like me, right? So, or people like you. So people with backgrounds in medical physics who can speak the same language as the academic researchers. Um, what we would do then is we, we, we do research with certain universities and we target certain universities that we know are very good at, let's say cardiovascular imaging or oncology or neurology. And we say, look, we have this software, this AI algorithm will you test it for us on 70 patients with known stroke um, or with a certain biomarker? And they'll publish the research and then we'll use that as evidence for an FDA submission for our particular product. So it's a bit of everything. It's a bit of um, contacting the right people, but also performing the right kind of studies. Yeah, I think um, the, the collaboration between the industrial and the clinical base uh, would be very important in order to have a win-win situation where both parties have the interest as well in this kind of situation, isn't it? Jay? Yeah, yeah. And like I said, it's kind of a win-win because you know we we might even fund them. So we give them the money to say we want to develop this new, you know, zero helium MRI. Will you test it for us? They produce all the academic publications and we get the evidence for an FDA submission to say, look, our, our product is actually very good. Um, now we can sell it in the United States or in Malaysia or wherever it is we want to sell it. Yeah, excellent. Um, right, I think I've read through all these questions in the chat box. Uh, I would like to open uh, one or two questions to the participants who would like to ask, li uh, ask live. Please unmute yourself if you'd like to ask question to Jim. Uh, I just want to comment. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, Prada, yeah, please sure. go ahead. Yeah, uh, at the University of Malay Medical Center, we had, had uh, several research collaboration with the industry, with Siemens. Uh, the latest uh, completed was on MRI. Uh, that was a, a very good, uh, just as Jim has described, uh, we wrote a proposal. Uh, well, of course, we have the latest uh, MR scanner from uh, Siemens. It linked us up with uh, the A star in Singapore and also with uh, Korea. And there's, we really uh, developed some expertise and, of course, some publications and so on. Yeah, that is uh, a very uh, challenging yet fulfilling also fruitful collaboration. Uh, encourage those who are listening to uh, try that. Uh, this is doable. Uh, we have done it. I'm sure different centers have done it. So yeah, um, I, I would echo that. I would, if anyone out there has any good ideas for you know to approach any company, not just not just Siemens because I work for them, but any company that that makes a product that you're interested in, you can freely approach them, and they they you know you the most they can say is no. Um, they may pay you to do certain evaluations on certain tools, or they may give you your institution a product for free uh, if you test it. Um, there's lots of different routes, and especially it's easier with the bigger companies, like like Prof Kwan said about Siemens, you know, because they're such a big company, it's easy to have a research collaboration. Some of the smaller companies might be even easier because they want to make their name and they want to promote their tools and products like that. So I would absolutely encourage anyone to do it. Yep, any more questions from others? Right, seems, uh, right, there's no taker at the moment. So James, I would like to ask the last question for you. If anybody of us would like to collaborate with Siemens, what would be the first step or the steps uh, or tips that you would like to advise us? The first route would be to contact your local Siemens representative and ask about who is your local collaborations manager. Um, some countries have collaborations manager in the country. Uh, some countries don't. So they, let's say, for example, if you're in Malaysia, I don't know if there's some there, but they may be based in Singapore or Hong Kong, for example. Um, there will be someone to cover your region, regardless of what part of the world you're in. Or now that you have my email address, send me an email. We're all one organization, so we can direct anyone to the right person. That's wonderful. I think due to the time constraint, we would like to uh, end the session by concluding uh, our webinar today. And really, we will be inspired by your talk, uh, James, uh, especially when you show us about all these uh, happenings, uh, technologies, uh, the advancement in technologies, what happened in the market. And I think it opens uh, another chapters for all of us to look into if we've uh, in, in this era. So I think uh, without further ado, um, Please join us, uh, join, join me to thank uh, James again for your great talks. So thanks again, everyone, for your uh, joining us tonight. And I would like to share with you guys about the next uh, webinar will take place in September 2022 uh, by Professor Thomas Crown from Peter McCallum Cancer Center, Australia. He'll be talking about motion management in radiotherapy, getting the physicists closer to patients. So with that, thank you, James, uh, again, and thanks everyone again. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, you for participating. Participant. Thank you for participating. I will end the recording now.